Hey everybody. Um, thanks so much for having us today. This is <laughs> this is an awesome turnout. Uh, my name is Tracy. Oh, no problem. I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Tracy. I'm the Speakers Bureau Coordinator at Hands On Hartford. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit of information um, and then I'm going to pass it on to our speakers and then we'll open it up for a Q&A. Um, so basically what we do is we travel around we try to really talk about the stereotype and the stigma that's attached to homelessness. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background about Hands on Hartford, Hands on Hartford is a nonprofit organization in downtown Hartford. We offer a number of different programs. We have a soup kitchen, um, which offers lunch and dinner three times a week. We have a food pantry where guests can come in, um, and it's, it's set up as a grocery store, so guests can um, get food. We have um, Supportive housing for people living with HIV AIDS. They receive medical services, 24 hour security. Um, we have a backpack program where backpacks are packed for um, students on the weekends. So if they have food that, you know, it'll be filled with mac and cheese, um, oatmeal, stuff that kids know how to cook. Um, what else do we have? Oh, we have senior community meals um, so that seniors also get food on the weekends. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about homelessness. Um, does anyone have um, any idea how, how many people it affects in Connecticut? Yeah? 40%. How, what do you think for a number? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I think that's a little bit high. Anyone else have a guess? That's an awesome guess. It's about 4,500. Hartford's experiencing about 1,000 people on any given night have home, or experiencing homelessness. Um, so I just want to point, uh, push out a question to you guys. Um, when you guys think of homelessness, or, or when you've heard people talk about homelessness, uh, what comes to mind? Yeah. Choosing not to work. So they choose to be homeless. Okay, a lot of choice. Anyone else? Yeah. People that don't have family support. Okay. Anyone else? Anything you've heard about homelessness? Yeah. Mental health issues. Okay. Yeah. Drug addiction. Sure. Yeah. So I think what I heard you say was people sleeping in California in boxes needing shelter. Okay, anyone else? Okay, awesome. Well, I'm gonna pass it off to someone who's got lived experience who can really open your eyes and, and talk about their personal experience. I'm gonna welcome Joe. Thank you, everybody. My name is Joe. I live in Bristol, and in 2011, I was homeless only for six weeks. But in that six weeks, I had an eye-opening experience. Now, I'd like to pose a question to everybody. What does a homeless person look like to you? Like they're wearing clothes that they have to wash for a while. They don't So if I presented myself to you, you wouldn't think I was homeless. This is how I've always looked, this is how I've always been. So try to break down the walls, try to think differently, try to think outside the box. Um, I had landed my dream job in 2005. I got a job as a warehouse manager. I was making $45,000 a year. I figured I had made it. 2010, I hurt myself on the job in August, summer of that year. Um, long story short, they decided to get rid of my position rather than deal with the medical part of it. So in, for my 50th birthday, I got a pink slip and a goodbye. And I had a workman's comp claim going, and there was a battle between unemployment and workman's comp who was gonna pay me, so I had no income coming in. Previous year before that, I had just given my life savings to my son because he went to Lincoln Tech. I gave him $10,000 to go in the HVAC program, so I had no money in the bank. 
but I was comfortable because I was making I had a paycheck coming in every two weeks. So January, I said to my landlady, I said, this is my situation. She was okay with it. She said, what can you do? I started making phone calls. Um, in the meantime, you have to understand now I have a phone. I want you to think of someone out on the street that has no phone, has no support, has no capabilities of doing things. I called, I called every number possible. I called 211, I got every agency. And the same thing was said to me. We can help you if you have an income coming in. We have a program that'll stop you from being evicted, but you have to have an income coming in. And I said, this is my situation. We can't do anything for you. I kept calling, calling, calling. I must have called at least 50 different places and try to get the people to call you back. And the frustration of that was every time you would call, you'd have to give the same story over. You'd call the same place back, you talk to somebody different, you have to tell your story all over again. You go fill out a form, you go back, you fill out the same form over again. I was getting really frustrated, but I still was hoping that something good was gonna come out of it. I kept persevering because it's just the way I am. I won't take no for an answer. Um, move forward. I lost my uh, duplex, I lived in Newington. I was evicted in May of 2010, 2011. So I had to sell my car and go live on a hotel in the Berlin Turnpike. Luckily, I said to myself, there's gotta be something I can do. So I called Senator Blumenthal's office and I said, look, I'm not looking for a handout. I'm not looking for anything others or any program I haven't looked into that can help me find housing. This is my situation. At the same time, I knew I had unemployment finally decided they're going to pay me, but that wasn't going to start until June. So I'm stuck in this void. Luckily, through the senator's office and his intervention, um, they were able to find me a program called HPRP, which is Rapid Rehousing and Recovery, which is income contingent. You have to have an income. What they do is they find you an apartment, they pay your first month's rent, they pay your security deposit, and then you take it from there. If it wasn't for that and for me persevering and pursuing all these avenues, I never would have been housed. Well, let me tell you about living in a motel on the Berlin Turnpike. Um, you're surrounded by things that you aren't accustomed to. Um, <laughs> and every night I had the police at my door looking for somebody or another, whether it be drugs or a criminal or whatever. Why I lived in that hotel on the Berlin Turnpike for six weeks, one person killed himself behind the hotel and two people were shot there. And this is what got me my eyes open saying, okay, once I get housed, I'm going to do something to try to change this. In the meantime, I'm still calling all these places. I'm still trying to find a job. I have a bad knee. I, everything was against me because of my age. And basically, when you're 50 years old and you try to find a job after you've been doing something for 25 years, it's awfully tough, and especially after that economy. So once the HBRP, I went and filled all the paperwork. They found me an apartment in Forestville, got me housed. But it didn't stop me. So for six weeks, I was homeless. I never hit the street. I was able to hide it from my children because I told them I had something in the works because I wasn't going to burden them with my problems. But this is what opened my eyes to what people have to go through, okay? I had a telephone. I had the ability to speak and communicate. There are people out on the street that don't have a phone, don't have the time, don't want to put in the effort because they've already been down and it's tough. So I'm thinking to myself, it was tough for me just to get out of it. And for the six weeks, it was very uncomfortable. There's no reason to tell you all the horror stories I went through. I consider myself lucky. There are people in our group who aren't here today that have been homeless for years, that live in shelters, and I consider myself blessed. Those people are the real people, and I, I don't feel like I belong because of what they went through. But I'm gonna persevere and make sure I change it to make it easier. Everyone, like you said, I heard a bunch of stereotypical things come out here. Everyone has their own impression of why a person is homeless, but once you are homeless and you've been knocked down and you have no alternative, what, what is there out there? There are no programs that help people that are on the street. People in shelters that's not being housed, that's just a stepping stone. The shelter system has become the housing system for this country. Supportive housing only costs $54 a day. It costs $600 a day to keep someone in prison. It costs $1,000 a day to keep someone in a hospital. But there's, there's so much red tape that you have to go through. And it's really incredible the amount of stuff that is available to people, but only if you have income. So the people that are forgotten are the people that are out in the streets. And last night when it snowed, I think about the people living out on the streets. So my, my 
my thing is, is that homelessness can happen to anyone. I'm housed now, you know, I have a car again. I'm on disability. I probably won't ever have a full-time job again, but my job right now is to be part of this group and to try to help change things through the government. Now I wanna throw some numbers at you because I started doing research into this. We've spent, since President Johnson in 1964 declared the war on poverty, over $16 trillion on programs in this country, okay? Out of that $16 trillion, we are worse off with the poverty level in this country than we were when it started. What it happened is there's a lot of mismanagement. You have a lot of people and organizations that are going, supposed to help people that make a six-figure income. That's just wrong, I'm sorry. You can't be doing that if you're in a human service organization. So all that money has been spent, and where are we? We're worse off than when we started. I think there, it's time to start calling our legislatures, which I do, I email them, I write letters of Congress, I'm in contact with Senator Blumenthal's office, I say a lot of things, sometimes I don't like it, but it's true. It's mismanagement of the funds. If the money would be spent wisely, you see so many empty buildings and so much potential to house people. The problem is house the people first and then work on them. You have to get them off the streets. Unfortunately, the people aren't here that could tell you the real life story of being homeless. Ralph is new to our group, he'll speak to you soon, but you'll have a different story than I have. But something else I wanna throw out to you too, in 2007, the state of Connecticut was number one in the nation in child homelessness. You think about that. We think about the state as being one of the richest in the nation. Why, why were we number one in child homelessness? At any given time, one out of four children in the state is living in poverty. And people in the state are one disaster away from being in poverty or losing their home or their housing. One other thing too that I like, to, some of the people in my group, you know, people laugh at this, but I'll tell you a story. We have a gentleman, you ever see the people with their carriages and their shopping bags picking all the bottles out of the garbage cans or off the side of the street? They're called nicklers. Well, he told me a story one day, he was happy when the water bottles got a five cent deposit on them because he got a raise. He was able to get more money and he used to hang out by uh, Central New Britain on the weekends especially, you make a lot of money because all the fraternities were having parties, so you just wait out, wait by the garbage can and collect. But you think about these things, it, it's funny in a way, but you know, he can laugh at it, but think about the little things that we take for granted, what a nickel means to somebody. So I just wanna let you know, it can happen to anyone, it happened to me, I couldn't believe it, but I persevered. There are people out there that do not persevere, that have been knocked down, that have been dragged out by society who have a hard time relating to people because they don't believe in them, they've lost faith. And it's my goal and my purpose, I guess, now that, like my children told me, this must have happened to me for a reason because I was in the right place at the right time. I'm gonna persevere with this group. And it's, it's, it's an emotional subject to me, but I do, I'm gonna continue on and Hopefully I opened your eyes a little bit and when we have questions and answers, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. But thank you for listening to me and coming out today. And again, it can't happen to anyone, but I just ask you not be judgmental when you see someone, just think about where that person came from. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Um, my name is Ralph. Thank you uh, for allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I write for the Beat of the Street. I have an article in there, or uh, this recent edition, and some poetry. We'll get around to reading it. Um, the issue of homelessness is very profound. There, uh, the variety of people who end up with this issue uh, is mind boggling because even though we do have stereotypes, uh, truthfully, it goes from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, my brother who lived out in Long Beach would tell me stories of famous movie actors uh, who out there, they live in their cars and they still try to go to Hollywood parties and stuff and pretend like they're still doing okay, but really they're just as homeless as anybody else. Um, so, like I said, the, the variety of homeless is, is unbelievable. Um, Joe mentioned the youth homeless issue, which uh, can happen very quickly. 
And an example of this would be um, if you got into a relationship with somebody that your parents didn't approve of, uh, for instance, and uh, it's created friction, and before you know it, um, they just don't want to deal with it anymore, and next thing you know, you're out on the street looking for a place to live. Uh, it happens quite a bit. Or make a bad decision. Uh, everybody makes bad decisions, and I've made plenty of bad decisions, and one of those bad decisions uh, ended me in the prison system. So um, I was uh, maybe six or eight months, but when you go to prison, you pretty much lose everything because people act like you're never coming back. So everything you own is subject to whatever happens, your car gets towed. And so when you come out, you have nothing. And I was fortunate that I had a friend. Um, a lot of times you can be allowed to leave early if you have a place to go. So fortunately I was able to get in touch with a friend who said, sure, I've, I've got an extra room in my apartment and uh, you can come here and give you some time to get on your feet. So I was extremely grateful. So I came out early and uh, I went to his apartment and I had my own room, my own room and uh, I felt like I was doing pretty good. And he said, you know, when you get around to getting a job, uh, you can give me some rent. In the meantime, get on your feet. I said, oh, well, this is a really good friend. So um, I did. I, I looked at the newspaper and I did all the things that a person is supposed to do when they're trying to change their life for the better, which I definitely was. So um, I managed to land a really good job in a short amount of time. And I really felt like I was on my way to, to doing better things. And then I got involved in a relationship um, and so things were getting even better. You know? And then I had a friend who uh, inherited a lot of money and was going through some stuff, so he wanted to sell his Corvette. So I said, well, all right, I can't pay for the whole thing, but I'm doing pretty well. I'll give you half the money and I'll make some payments. So now within six months of coming out of prison, I got myself an apartment, a girlfriend, and a Corvette, you know, and a good job. So I had everything that everybody, you know, would strive to get, especially starting from ground zero. So I was pretty happy with all that. And then this is how quickly things can turn around for you. <laughs> so uh, my friend was um, not, I guess you could say not being totally upfront about what his plans were for the apartment. And uh, he knew the owner of the building, so he had some type of arrangement. And you know, to me it sounded like I was going to be there for a while, so I was pretty settled in. But then within a few months, he uh, changed his mind. Or some, something went, happened between him and the landlord. At the same time, the company that I was working for, which uh, restored antique automobiles, and uh, it was a job that I really liked too. Uh, they appreciated me and I appreciated the job. Um, he was doing some shady stuff. So uh, he started bouncing checks and stuff like that. Um, and my friend told me about a month before, well, I'm deci I decided to move. So I had a month to try to figure out what I was going to do. And at the same time, my girlfriend had, had moved in with me, um, which he was okay with as long as I paid a little extra rent. So it was, you know, I thought everything was fine. But then, so now I have a month to find a place to live with my girlfriend. And of course, the Corvette broke down and they wanted like $3,000 to fix it. So I got rid of the Corvette and uh, I was trying to work myself into another place to live. Well, it's, it's not that easy, um, especially when the job goes. So things just fell apart really fast. So basically I ended up um, trading the Corvette for a car and some cash because I needed to do something fast. So I ended up with a Buick Park Avenue, which was where me and my girlfriend ended up living in the Buick. So um, we would drive around and I would try to find jobs. I would find work here or there. And, we were sleeping in the, in, the, in the Park Avenue. Now, the funny thing about living in a car is that wherever you park, it doesn't matter if it's a commuter parking lot or behind a building, with, somebody calls the police. So every time you fall asleep and you get comfortable, you get a knock on the window, and the police, the first thing that they're concerned with is whether you're driving drunk because you're asleep in a car. 
So they always pull you out and they ask you many questions. So there's really no place that you can park that doesn't, I mean, very few places, let's say, that doesn't create some type of uh, issue for somebody. Um, I mean, I understand people, you know, they want to make sure you're not, you know, whatever, something's wrong, you know, it's not really their fault if they see a couple of people in a, in a car, they think something's wrong, so they, you know, it's, I'm not blaming anybody. It's just the way it is. But it's not like there's a, a park for homeless people who live in cars, you know, where you could all just go park there and camp out and stuff like a concert or something like that. It just doesn't work that way. So, but I, I always thought commuter parking lots would uh, be okay, but that's out of the question. They, they come through, they do a, pat a patrol, and uh, they see you sleeping in your car, and you gotta go, doesn't matter what time it is. So we would always end up, I, well, let me just say, I remember one incident in particular, staying in a commuter parking lot, and what we would do is pack everything on the floor of the front seat so that the seat was a little bigger and both of us could stay in one seat instead of one in the front and one in the back. And so we would be snuggled up in the front seat, uh, real tight, and trying to stay warm when it was cold and stuff without having to use a lot of gas and keep the heater on. And so we're asleep in the commuter parking lot, and uh, all of a sudden this light shine scared the crap out of us. I mean, we thought it was like some type of alien invasion or something. It was just this light shining us in the middle of the night, and we were just freaking out. We both started screaming so loud. It was like... It was, on, it was like a movie, really, and, and it, the, the cop jumped back because he, he was shining his light right in our face, and uh, I mean, it was really scary. I thought we were getting abducted or something, for real. <laughs> so um, that was just one thing. So eventually, you know, I would find work, and would, you know, I have to pay the insurance and everything on the car, and so I would manage to maintain that way for, for quite a while while trying to find some stable housing. And, uh, but of course, you can guess what happens next the car breaks you know so now you have a car that's uh, not doing too good and eventually um, trying to maintain the car and uh, the insurance lapses and then the car gets towed and then you are down to very few options at this point so fortunately that happened in the summer so we decided that we would get a little tent and try that for a little while. So um, we were in the tent, but the thing about living in a tent that a lot of homeless people go through is that somebody always comes along, some kids or somebody in the neighborhood, some and they just trash your stuff. Like, you know, even though they can obviously see that you're actually trying to live there, they, it just always happens, it's inevitable, no matter how far out in the woods you want to put the tent, uh, somebody's gonna come along and just have a good time just totally ransacking whatever you have so that becomes a problem so the tent thing didn't work out because where we had put it once again somebody called the police told us we had to move so we were sort of wandering around so we tried the shelter thing and uh, to be on, to be perfectly honest with you living in a shelter is really not that different from being in, in prison um, because it, it's very similar um, Somebody's telling you what to do. You're living on a bunk in a dorm type environment. I mean, it's, truthfully, I think in some ways prison might be better than living in a shelter. Um, I mean, they both have advantages and disadvantages, but they're very comparable. And if you're in a relationship like that, you definitely can't stay together. So sometimes, uh, um, you know, she might have to go across town, something like that, meet up in the morning. Um, things like that. There are a few places where they have family type uh, situations, but since we weren't really a family, we didn't have children, um, that sort of thing without a question, so we usually had to split up. So we weren't too big on the whole shelter scene. So what ended up happening is uh, we started sleeping in the park um, by the river. Uh, and what happened there was, uh, the rangers would come by in the morning and they sort of felt bad so they didn't really bother you too much so i got a lot of respect for the rangers they you know they weren't there to hassle anybody um so we decided to try to move further into the woods instead of being like so in the park so, so one night we are asleep and i hear a noise 
And about 15 feet away, there's a coyote digging through some roots. And I thought it was kind of cool, but totally freaked her out. She was like scared to death. So that same night, I had felt something bite me in my arm. And I thought it was just a little bug or something. And uh, what ended up happening is I had gotten bit by a spider. And my whole arm swelled up to like ridiculous proportions. And so after about a week, uh, it was getting really bad, so I had to go to the hospital, and they had to do emergency surgery because the spider had somehow laid eggs in my arm, and um, I had to get antibiotics. And it's the first time I ever actually had to stay in the hospital my entire life. I never stayed overnight in the hospital until I got bit by the spider. And so the, the good news on that was we had six days in the hospital where she was able to stay in the room, and uh, we had a place to stay for six days. So. That part of it was okay, and some food and everything didn't have to worry about. But we got when I, when I got out of the hospital, um, I wanted to immediately try to find some kind of money. Uh, so I was picking up little jobs here and there. I mean, I've never been lazy, so uh, whatever type of work didn't matter whether I liked it or not, uh, I was willing to do it. So I managed to get up about. $300 or something, and I said, okay, well, let's go get a room in a rooming house. So um, there really wasn't too many options for rooming houses. Um, so we found one in a horrible neighborhood, a lot of crazy stuff going on. But I said, well, you know, it's better than sleeping in the park and getting bit by spiders. So we went to the rooming house and um, when I spoke to the owner of the rooming house, he said to me, are you sure you want to stay here? And I said, you know, I really don't have a whole lot of options. It's, uh, I only have $300. And so he said, are you really sure you want to stay here? I'm like, I don't know what you're trying to say, but I'll try it. So we got to the rooming house. Well, as it turned out, it was some type of gang meeting house that we had moved into and <laughs> things that were getting really crazy in that house. Um, so I had a lot of issues with people trying to hit on my girlfriend, all this crazy stuff was going on. And uh, I mean, it, some of the stuff is just, it's just unbelievable what the way people live. And so I ended up getting into a fight uh, because I didn't really have a choice, and it was it was all, so. Then the landlord comes up to me and says, "Oh well, you know, uh, I heard about that fight situation, and uh, would you like to be the superintendent?" I said, "Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you?" I said, "If you gave me a gun, I would not be the superintendent of this building." I said, "I want to get out of here as fast as I can. I, I forget that." So. Um, Eventually, we did get out of there because after that first incident, they sort of had a target on me. So I said, we got to go. So we were back in the park again, pretty much. And um, eventually, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly how we got out of this mess. I think, if I remember correctly, somebody allowed us to stay in their uh, apartment for a while so we were sort of couch surfing and uh, then eventually we split up and uh, a bunch of other stuff happened but the point uh, that really matters there's a lot of people who um, are living in their cars and uh, whether you're living in your car or you're staying in a shelter or you're just couch surfing yeah you're, you're still homeless and uh, homelessness uh, is a problem that you know, with a lot of problems, there may not be a solution, but there's always improvement. And homeless is one of those things that uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. There definitely is a lot of room for improvement. So, um, really, the bottom line is how we see each other as human beings. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, 
life is short and uh, we just need to love each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time we can open it up for questions. You had, you had said that you had kids, but did you try to... two children. They're both older. My daughter was married and my son was living with his girlfriend at the time. My son and his girlfriend lived in a efficiency apartment because they had just decided to go out on their own and I told them not to worry about me that I had something in the works but I had to temporarily stay somewhere. My daughter and her husband were living in a rental. They had just had another baby so they had two children so I knew there was I wasn't going to force that upon them because I'm a proud person everyone has pride you know so I figured I could get out of this so I was able to string them along for five and a half weeks while I was waiting for my apartment to be ready the last week, they finally said, you know, Dad, stop pulling the wool over our eyes. We know you you don't have anywhere to go. And I said, I do, but I did have a couch surf on my son's apartment one night with my daughter and son, yeah. But uh, yeah, they, they were aware of my situation. I had lost a job, but I basically did a little bit and said that things were, were in the works and it was gonna work quicker than it did, but. Could you just say a little more about that rapid recovery housing thing? Yes, that was, does it work? can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, that was part of the stimulus program that was passed in 2009. It was called Rapid Rehousing and Recovery. And it was part of the, uh, there was a Christmas center in Hartford that you would go to. And the contingency for that was, like I said, they would find you a place to live that you had to have income coming in that you could prove that you could pay for your apartment. But their whole program was they'll pay your rent, your first month's rent, and your security deposit to get you back on your feet. And you were assigned a case manager with that who would meet with you monthly to make sure that your finances were in order, that you were going to be able to keep the roof over your head. But if something happened, like in my case, I did lose my income for one month when Workman's Comp decided to take over from unemployment and they paid my rent for that month. Um, so it was a good program. Unfortunately, the funding ran out and it's it's city contingency now. I believe the city of Hartford still has a rapid recovery and rehousing program, but not every city does, but this was statewide. You could qualify as long as you met those guidelines. Other questions? So is it you guys had girlfriends, but like, did they have jobs or a place to stay, or what was their situation like? I'll, I'll just quickly say I had no girlfriends. Uh, <laughs> I was married for ten and a half years, and it didn't work out. But uh, we remained friends, so it's kind of a stupid situation where we got along better not being married than we do being married. So. Oh, oh sorry, I get to, okay. Yeah, in my situation. Um, my girlfriend was, uh, she had a, a strange uh, housing situation of her own, so uh, she moved in with me and she was working, but uh, when things fall apart, they, they just fall apart so quick that even if, you know, you have a small job, it, it's barely enough to maintain anything, you know, between trying to keep a car insured and on the road and uh, if only one person's working and they're not really don't have a real good job uh you're treading water is really what it really is hi i was wondering um for ralph when you were in the hospital for six days um they just like set you off they didn't ask you where you were going or give you any kind of follow-up medication or rehab or weren't worried about what was going to happen to you that's a, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. 
Uh, well, originally they were going to let me go with my arm completely infected, and if it wasn't for my government's insistence that they check it, um, I probably would have ended up with a serious staph infection in my heart uh, because it was traveling so fast, the infection. The spider uh, actually had laid eggs in my arm, and um, the hospital's not really concerned uh, about where you live. Uh, that's not really part of their uh, protocol. Um, a lot of times, homeless people will go to the hospital emergency room and try to sleep there. It's very common. And eventually, they will figure out that you're not there for any type of emergency, and they will tell you to move along. Um, but uh, as far as follow-up care, they gave me some medication and sent me on my way. Actually, I actually have a two-part question for you. Um, how did you afford the bills? Because I'm guessing they didn't give it to you for free. And also, was there, because you said you slept in um, parks and whatnot, I'm guessing there were other homeless people there. And how did they like interact with you? Another good question. <laughs> um, the first part has to do with what the hospital bills. Um, well, usually if you don't have insurance, um, they, they're obligated to take care of you, even though they might resist a little, but uh, when it's serious, they, they really don't have a choice. So they deal with that later. They'll, they'll send you a bill, or they'll send you a bill, and then you pass the bill onto the state, and the state will pick up the tab retroactively, as long as it hasn't been too long. So uh, that's really not a big concern if, you know, if you have a serious problem. As far as living in a park with other uh, homeless people, there's always the possibility of conflicts. I mean, there's no security whatsoever, uh, especially when you're in some type of relationship. Um, a lot of times, they develop communities uh, in the park or under the bridge, and they sort of work together, will sometimes cook together, or uh, one person will stay and keep an eye on stuff. and so. Uh, usually it's not a real threatening situation to be with these people. There's a lot of genuinely decent people that just you know, find themselves. And some people are so accustomed to living this way that um, they don't even really, well, you know, they, they've been doing it for so long that they're not even, you know, either they're frustrated or for their own reasons, uh, they just maintain that particular style and just you know continue i mean like i said there's all different varieties of help. but for the most part it's not a threatening situation I mean, so. thank you first of all thank you for sharing your story it takes a lot of courage to do that we really appreciate it um i'm not sure if i have a question or a comment but um, you both said that it's, you know, it's hard to find the resources. You don't know what the resources are. And most of us in this room, if it were to happen to us today, we would have no idea where to look for resources. So would, do you feel that people who end up in, in being homeless, do you think that they would be accepting of an advocate who could come to them and say, you know, hey, I got some ideas, or these are some organizations I know about, or something like that. I mean, would advocacy be something that would be helpful to the homeless, and would it be accepted? Yeah, to, to speak to your question, there are plenty of organizations out there. Unfortunately, people that are homeless now, like something we didn't touch upon, someone else in our group would be better at talking this, but. A lot of people that are homeless go into a shelter. A shelter is only supposed to be a temporary residence, and you have a worker there, and you have a caseworker, hopefully working, but the caseworker's file is like this. So you have one person for maybe, what is it, two, 3,000 people? So that would be your advocate. So how much advocacy can be done? God only knows. But what happens is a lot of people shelter jump. You can only stay at a shelter for so long. I think it's six weeks, correct? Uh, it depends on the shelter. Depends on the shelter. Okay, once you leave that shelter, you can go to the next shelter. So it becomes a revolving door. The shelters were never meant to be permanent housing, but that's what they've become because there's so much stagnation of no permanent housing for people in that situation. And with the economy being like it is, it's tough. So I hope I answer your question. If someone becomes homeless now, 
you would call 211 if you have the ability. If you're already homeless and on the street, most of the people I've met in my three years that I've been involved in the two groups that I'm involved with have been homeless for a while and they've given up because they just haven't been helped. So they have no faith in the system, they have no faith in people, and they have very little faith left in themselves. But it, it's, you know, it's tough. It, me, myself, making all the phone calls I did, I honestly, I must have called at least 500 phone calls in a four month period. And you call 211, 211 is overwhelmed. They are the information center for the state, but they'll give you the numbers. Unfortunately, they're not updated. A lot of numbers they give you sometimes, those places aren't even in existence anymore. And like they, you call, they'll still tell you that there's rapid rehousing and recovery. They don't realize that that program ended. Also, I just, I wanted to speak to what Ralph was talking about, the hospitals. See, like you say, you don't know about the resources. If you go to any hospital, most hospitals in the state of Connecticut have something called the bed fund. If you can't afford to pay for care, you ask that you want to apply for the bed fund. And whether the state picks up the tab or the hospital pick up the tab, like you said, they can't refuse your service. But you wouldn't know that unless you were in that situation, because I had that happen to me where I had to use it. And you know, they, most hospitals in the state do have a bed fund that they'll help pay for your care if you have an extended stay. I just like to add something to it. Uh, when you become homeless, um, you have no choice but to find whatever resources you can uh, as fast as possible. So usually the first thing that happens is you start to locate the soup kitchens and places that provide food. And uh, they are doing, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the soup kitchens are doing some one beautiful work because uh, they, there's always seems to be a place to find something to eat, uh, which is a great thing. And then, you know, he's dealt more with the trying to find uh, through agencies and stuff like that. And I, I just tried to find a job and get on my feet, you know, and so I didn't really go through all those channels. Uh, but you do get very resourceful as far as what, what you need to do from day to day. Uh, with all, you know, all sorts of things, so. I just want to add to that too. Um, just, we haven't really talked about the, the complete lack of affordable housing and, you know, just the fact that it's tough to find a job, you know, it's tough to find a job making a livable wage. So that on top of a lack of housing, you know, it puts you in, in the sort of spot of like, okay, well then, you know, I'll go to a shelter. And then you start realizing all of the rules and barriers just with the shelter system. So you have to be out at seven o'clock in the morning, regardless of any, you know, you know what temperature it is, whatever. Um, and then, you know, like Ralph was saying, it's finding, you know, where is that soup kitchen? What time does the library open? I could hang out in there for a while. You know, where can I get a bathroom? So all of a sudden you're in this cycle, and then you have to be back at the shelter by four or five o'clock. Um, so you're you're bouncing in between, you know, maybe I can apply for some jobs in this time, but then I got to go catch my meal, then I got to catch the bus. So you're just constantly in this cycle of what becomes permanent when it was just supposed to be a temporary thing. Hey, I'll go to the shelter, I'll get a night's rest, and then you know I'll be connected to something else. That's <laughs> that's really not happening in the shelters. Um, case managers are overwhelmed and they're just you know unable to connect those resources. Um, Another question. Do you feel like you've been able to fully recover from being homeless, or do you feel like you're still dealing with residual consequences? The, the question was if you've been able to fully recover from homelessness. Another good question. <laughs> um, you, know, I, you know, I sort of have to think about that one, really, because um, it's, there's always this ongoing struggle. I mean, sometimes when, let's, let me put it to you this way. Uh, I don't want to ever think that um, I'll feel totally secure in my situation, whatever it is, because things can happen so fast and uh, they just spiral out of control, I mean, in an instant. So uh, it's changed my view on a lot of things. I can definitely tell you that. As far as, uh, I mean, mentally, yeah, I mean, I've recovered and, uh, you know, I have fairly stable housing at, at, at the time to speak, but once again, uh, you know, the things can change so fast, so there's always that, uh, you know, in the back of my mind.
how do you think the government can help those people? I wish I had enough time to answer that question, but like I spoke to you before, we've spent over $16 trillion on the war on poverty. Uh, it just disgusts me when I see the mismanagement of funds and people aren't aware of that. That's what I complain to the government about. I'm writing emails to congressmen, senators, you know, the governor, and Senator Blumenthal's office is very well aware of who I am. Um, they're very nice about it, but, you know, there are programs out there, but they only last for so long, you only can take advantage of them for so long. If we could have people sort of micromanage the funds that are going into these programs and really look how they're being spent, if they're being spent efficiently or not, like I said, when you have people running these organizations that are making six figures, how can you connect to someone if you're in human services or making $100,000 a year? It just, it, the whole system needs to be revamped. There, no one wants to do it, no one wants to touch it. The system's broken. It has to be restarted again. Um, touching a little bit like what Ralph was saying about when you're looking for meals, soup kitchens, whatever, fortunately I wasn't thrust in that, but they showed me where the food pantries are. When you go to a food pantry, they'll load you up with canned goods, but like myself, I had a bout of high blood pressure and there's heart disease in my family. The sodium in the canned food, you can't eat that stuff because it'll kill you. They don't, you don't get nutritious food. You get food, but not nutritious food. There's so many aspects of what the government could do and step in. And, you know, as you see how Washington works now, it doesn't, so it, it's tough. It's, it's an unanswerable question. What I would say is, you know, I'm reminded, I was in Waterbury this past summer and there was a billboard that said, what can one person do? And it had a picture of Nelson Mandela. Well, I consider myself to be that one person. I'm gonna keep plugging away, then one person, then the next person, the next, and hopefully enough people get together and enough people raise their voices and it gets changed. Why don't you ask your friends to give you a job? I had, I was, I was a warehouse manager, and part of being a warehouse manager was operating a forklift and climbing up ladders and pulling things. When I hurt my knee, I couldn't do that anymore. I had done that basically all my life. So when you're taken out of your comfort zone, I know that this is going to sound funny, but it's, you know, it's hard to start over and find a job. I was 50 years old. I could have gotten a part-time job at Walmart as a greeter or a Target or whatever, but that's not going to pay everything. I had friends in the industry I was working in, but I couldn't do the heavy lifting that was required of most of the jobs, and most of them were entry-level positions. And I went to a couple places and they said, you're a manager, we, you know, you can't work, you can't load trucks, you can't unload trucks. So I did try that. I contacted a bunch of people, but at the time I lost my job, it was also the time when the, the country was just recovering from the recession that we had too, so it was, it was a bad time not to have a job. My name's Peter Spano, and the thing is that I'm on a commission in New Britain since 1975. It's called the Redevelopment Committee Neighborhood. We are open some apartments on Arch Street in New Britain for veterans, homeless veterans. And I'll leave you my card, and if you want to contact me, you can. But I have a beautiful home, but I'm going to tell you one thing. This is my second home. I love it here. 88 years old, next month, or something, 87, doesn't make any difference. And I, I just found it here wonderful, very good. But I am out to help veterans. So I was in the Navy in 1943, World War II. But I'll leave you my card, and whatever else I can do, I'll be glad to help you. Thank you. What, what he's saying is one thing we didn't touch upon. There shouldn't be one homeless veteran in this country unless it's by their choice. What, what we do to our veterans when they come back, irregardless of when they served or whatever, they should be provided every opportunity they could be. And it's a shame what happens to them, and there are a lot of homeless veterans. So I appreciate what you do, sir. Yes, I read it, an article in the New York Times that's over 5,000 homeless veterans, over 5,000 from World War II, Vietnam, in Korea. It shouldn't happen in this country. Really. Thank you. Can I take this home?
I, I've got a practical question about um, mail. How do you receive mail when you're homeless? And I would think that there's, you know, communications that you have to have with these agencies that you're trying to seek help from. How does that work? I mean, what do you do? Uh, another excellent question. Uh, as I was saying earlier, you, you, you find these resources as fast as possible, basically through the homeless community, people who've been doing it for a while, you might say, uh, pretty much you find the answers. The answer to that question would be that um, some of the shelters or soup kitchens will allow you to get your mail, use that as an address, because there is a problem if you were applying for uh, food stamps or uh, things like that, trying to get the ball rolling from things that you're not accustomed to, and you have to go through all this red tape. Or, uh, definitely an address is crucial. So uh, that's one of the ways that people uh, work around that. Uh, they also, uh, showers is an issue. And uh, a lot of these uh, soup kitchens and places have uh, things just for that set up so that people who are transient or whatever uh, in, in between um, can take showers. And so, the, I mean, there's solutions to a lot of this stuff and you find out quick, but they're all band-aids, like putting a band-aid on a hemorrhage, you might say, you know what I'm saying, so. Um, I've, I heard a lot of horror stories about mail. Um, I know that some places a lot, like the local library, use your ad, use that library address for um, for mail, but I've heard, you know, stuff gets lost, people don't get it. Um, something else, too, is when you're applying for a job, you know, if you put down a shelter address, you know, at least in Hartford, there's a chance that that employer is going to know like that address and like put it right to the bottom. Um, so the address is a tricky thing. Um, how is it socializing after um, being homeless? I mean, it, it must be tough. You're being with like one person or you're alone, and then once you're reintegrating into society, like talking to other people again. That must feel really, I don't know, strange in a way, and maybe I have no clue. I mean, that's why. <laughs> well, truthfully, the uh, the homeless community is so large that you're never really alone. I mean, if you're in the park, if you're under the bridge, if you're in the shelter, you're around more people than you even really want to be around. You know, you're forced to be around people a lot of times that you don't really have a choice in the matter. So I don't think loneliness is is an, an overwhelming uh, problem. But I, I do want to say this. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, and give you guys the idea that every homeless person is the victim of some horrible circumstances when they're doing everything right. Uh, we all know that's not the case. A lot of people make bad decisions, and bad decisions with bad consequences. And, but that still doesn't change the fact that uh, there should be a means for when you want to change your life or when you want to get on the right path, there should be um, a path open to you to make that step without uh, getting so mired in, the, in the, the, the chaos that you just can't see your way out of it. And um, there's plenty of people who would fall into that category, whereas, yeah, they made some bad decisions and they ended up uh, and so they learn and they try to pick up their life, but then you find out how difficult it is. It's sort of like, I would use the analogy of like putting on a straitjacket. It's easy to put it on, but try getting out of it. You know, that's the best analogy I can think of at, at the moment. And so, um, you know, we can't say, oh, well, you made a bad decision, so you deserve what you get. Well, maybe you do deserve to learn, and when you're ready to learn, you deserve an opportunity to pick up and start over. I think um, too, for that question, it's like the opposite, where there's just a complete lack of privacy. You know, you're in a shelter with beds on top of beds on top of beds, there's 80 guys and you know maybe one working bathroom, and you're sharing showers. And um, so I think it's the opposite. And you're all, you know, it, it's, um, you know, you're going to meals at the same time. So everybody's trying to get in, everybody's in line. Um, so it's, it's almost the opposite.
did you ever consider, you were talking about how um, the shelter felt terrible to be in, recommitting a fence just to get back into jail so you didn't have to worry about eating and sleeping? Yeah. I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I actually have never considered that, but there is a phenomenon which uh, I refer to in my article, and they call it throwing the brick. And I wasn't aware that it was called that, or uh, just something that uh, I came across. And what that is, is basically uh, what you just described. People who do not want to deal with the shelter, and they do not want to deal with the cold winter, and they just, every winter, or every other winter, or however they do something uh, to get themselves locked up, and then they have, as they say, three hots and a cop. Now that is pretty sad. It, you know, the only option that they feel that they have is to do that. Well, we've got to really look at that. That's really very sad. Uh, I just want to ask what experience have uh, did you have being homeless um, and you want to give advice about that to the people that like we should be aware of experience like, like uh, you face a lot uh, about being homeless so you better uh, giving you, you have to give any advice you want to give to the people that you should be aware of about how not to become homeless. Yeah. Like I said, it, it could happen to anyone. I wasn't prepared for it. Um, like I said, luckily, I don't consider myself worthy to be part of this group because most of the people in this group have gone through what Ralph has gone through, but they were accepting of me, and it can happen to anyone. There's really nothing you can compare about. I, I think I read the other day, 40% of Americans are one disaster away from losing their, their home, losing their job, you know, being homeless because a lot of people in this country look paycheck to paycheck. I didn't want to get into the politics, but it, I think it's important for a lot of you young people to pay attention to what's going on in this country where they're talking about raising the minimum wage and making equal, you know, equal pay for women and all that. All that is part of it because most of the people that work in this country that make minimum wage are women. 70% of the workforce that make minimum wage are women in this country. And talking about raising and giving people a living wage really makes a lot of difference. A lot of people squawk about it, but if you think about it, $10 an hour is only $400 a week on 40 hours. Think about that and what you have to pay and everything. It's, it's not a lot, but all I can tell you is, you know, they tell you to save, but like I said, I want to politicize it, but the stagnation of wages in this country, it hasn't gone up. It hasn't gone up with inflation, and I'm not going to talk to the top 1% or the 99 percenters, but you can't be prepared for something like that. You can try to say, but it's tough in this economy, especially if you have children or you know, you're starting out in life. So all I could say to you is keep your eyes open and you know, hopefully nothing happens to you, but really pay attention to what's going on in this country now. Like I said, what can one person do? It's up to, you're the next generation. So you know, pay attention to it, follow it, and you know, it doesn't hurt to email your legislatures or the president. I've done that too. It, it doesn't hurt. You get replies. It may not be, it'll be from their staff, their staff secretary, but you do get replies. Let them know that you're aware of what's going on. I have a question for Ralph and basically both of you. Um, what is your status between um, you and your family? And do you have any brothers and sisters that were willing to help you out, or what was going on with that situation? That's a good question. Uh, well, I did have family. I, I grew up in Connecticut. My family was, uh, except my brother was out in California. Um, they were not inclined to really take me in. Uh, you know, they're just, uh, you know, sometimes family just just uh, there's just conflicts that you know and especially when you're dealing with a relationship that they don't approve of and you know there's all this sort of internal politics that can get involved and it's not like as soon as you trip and fall uh, your family is there to 
pick it up, you know, it's like, you're, you're a grown man, just get on your feet, you know, and that's it. Again, I think some parts of it has to do with the misunderstanding of the, how difficult it is uh, when they're used to you pretty much doing fine and having a job and then all of a sudden, and, and part of this, you, you don't even really want to go to them. I mean, like uh, Joan mentioned, there's, there's that pride issue of, you know, just can I have a place to stay when they know you got they got three kids? And so I do have family, but it's just looking back on it, I don't think I ever even considered it, truthfully. Hi. Can I just quickly, sorry, just, I just wanted to answer you. Um, my brother died in 1993, and uh, he died of service-related cancer, but it's because of the way he died and handled his illness that I'm able to persevere because I don't think there's any challenge that I can't do. He taught me how to live, and he also told me how to die without dignity, so I fear nothing, and I fear no one. Um, and Tracy will tell you, I'm not afraid to speak my mind. <laughs> so, and my sister lives out west, so basically that wasn't an option. Hi. After your experience, what is your concept about the life? What am I concerned about life? Concept. What is your what do you think about that life after your experience? Oh, about like, I, yeah, the difficult part. I'm grateful for each day as it comes. I, I live for the moment and, and what happens in it. I don't worry about tomorrow. I just worry about trying to get things changed so I can make life better for other people. Um, you know, I hate to be this way, but I'll throw out a quote to you, Albert Einstein said, a life lived not in service of others is a life wasted. So I try to live that way. I have the ability to help people, and if I change this one person's life, then the rest of my life is going to be worth it. So I enjoy everything. I have two grandchildren I enjoy. I enjoy my family. I enjoy music. You know, so I take one day at a time and enjoy just simple things, little things. I'd like to speak to that question, too. Um, the main thing that I think I've learned uh, um, from all the experience combined is that uh, material happiness uh, is very, uh, it doesn't solve all your problems. And it doesn't, the only way you find really true happiness is, is, is an internal thing. And so, uh, like Joe said, I stay in the moment, I stay in the day, and I find a lot more peace and uh, that way without really put myself through all this unnecessary stress, worrying about uh, what's going to happen. And there's, there's so many things that we can't control, and we can drive ourselves crazy with that stuff. So I just uh, go along with what he said and really stay with stay in the moment and try to be a decent human being. I mean, that's about all you can do, I think. Um, I just want to um, get to, I'm sorry, I forget your name, uh, but your teacher asked a question um, about about domestic violence um, being one of the causes of homelessness, and it's absolutely true. Um, we do have um, limited uh, domestic violence shelters so that people can stay there um, without other people knowing that they're there, um, but it's absolutely one of uh, the causes of, of homelessness. You know, you're in a dispute, you're not safe, you gotta get out of there, you know, where, where do you go? Um, so we, we talked about youth homelessness, we talked about veteran homelessness, we didn't really talk about family homelessness either, um, and that's definitely a rising population because of because of all of the economic stuff that we covered. Um, but families are definitely doubling what they call doubling up with other families, um, so that they're moving in because they're split up at shelters, um, because there's no place to go. Um, families just move in with other families. Um, if with that, some sh <laughs> depending on the shelter, um, at least in Hartford, we have a shelter where men and women. You know, there's um, there's top floor for men, bottom floor for women, and then you know if you're a 13 year old boy, you know you're not allowed in the shelter. Other children are allowed um, with mom. Um, younger girls are allowed with mom, but if you're over the age of 13 and you're a young man, you're not allowed in, and you're not old enough to be with the, the older men. Um, so that's sort of another layer of, of family homelessness and youth homelessness. Um, she also asked that I cover uh, this paper. I don't know if Ralph, you want to talk a little bit about, about this because this is uh, this is your, your people. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, the beat of the street. Uh, 
very good organization of people that uh, I got involved with, and they do um, a lot of, on the back is a resource guide, uh, basically for soup kitchens and uh, shelters, stuff like that. So uh, it's very helpful in, in that way, but it's also helpful in another way because uh, it provides um, a voice uh, for people because anybody can write and get their stuff published if it's, you know, uh, I mean, they have sort of an editor's bureau, but anybody who really can write an article uh, about how they're feeling, about uh, any of these issues, uh, can get it published. They also have a poetry section. And uh, just being able to have that voice and being able to use any type of art, uh, words, writing as a way to uh, validate people so that they can feel better about themselves. Even something small like uh, getting something published uh, can give somebody some confidence back. And uh, they do provide uh, gift cards for people who write. So they do as much as you can do with a newspaper uh, that started from basically nothing and has worked itself into, I think, 5,500 uh, circulation and is growing. Uh, so it's a, it's a phenomenal um, organization and I'm really proud to be part of it. And I uh, hope you read my article. <laughs> No. Uh, yeah. They have they have a Facebook page. I think they have a sort of sad I brought that up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to start a blog, but I guess they're not that. Yeah. They might be working on the website. I know they were talking about it. Um, but it's yeah, it's written by and for home, the homeless community. Um, and you guys can write in articles or anything you think of. Um, you can also contribute to it. And I brought some copies of that. Right. And they're next to the water on the way out, so you can pick it up and, and donate if you have change or a dollar or whatever you'd like. We have about um, 10 more minutes if anybody else has a additional question they'd like to ask. Yeah. Hold on, David. Um, at the beginning of the lecture, we talked about stereotypes, and one was mentioned was addiction. Um, I'm just curious as to how much that really plays a part in the homeless community. Unfortunately, in today's society, I think a lot of people, when they think of homelessness, they immediately think of addiction. Granted, like Ralph said before, there are a lot of people on the streets that have made bad choices, and they may have a drug problem, they may be alcoholics. It's hard to not get away from that when you don't have the supportive services and that's your only comfort. Um, I, a couple weeks ago I was talking to someone, I volunteer at, there's a soup kitchen in Hartford at Center Church. Every Saturday it's a community breakfast and everyone's welcome. And I was talking to someone who said that, you know, alcohol is his only way of remaining warm when he doesn't have a place to stay and you don't think about it in that respect. but. There, there are a lot of people out there that have addictions, they're just not getting the supportive services. Some refuse them, some continue to be, but you know, you could be in any given situation. Uh, you know, a couple of days ago, look at Philip Seymour Hoffman, there's a guy that has everything, and he dies with a needle in his arm in the bathroom floor, so it, it's, it's tough, you know. It, if you don't have the supportive service, you don't have the people supporting you and, and trying to get you off that, like Tracy was saying, it's a, it's a constant circle of, trying to go where I'm gonna get my next meal, where am I gonna sleep tonight, where am I gonna get a jacket, where am I gonna get a blanket, where am I gonna go for health services, and you're dealing with an addiction, it, it's tough. There are a lot of people out there that do have addiction, yes. Yeah. Are those all the papers for December? I think there's some January ones. Oh, okay, yeah. Because uh, I, I mentioned my article earlier, and I, it's only in the January one, I don't know if they, if they have December issue, it won't be in there. Uh, there definitely are a lot of addiction issues uh, with a percentage of the homeless population, you know, and a percentage that uh, really is is in that situation. Uh, you know, some of them are, are trying to work it out, some of them are trying to get help, some of them have just flat flat out given up, and so they just continue on that path. So uh, I mean, the variety of homeless. Some of them are ex-offenders who at one had an addiction issue and ended up going to jail 
and came out and are trying to do the right thing, but then it just becomes so frustrating. Uh, it's very easy to relapse when you're trying to do the right thing and you just are not, you're just treading water, as I said earlier. So uh, it definitely is that part of the equation, but it's definitely not the whole equation. I think too, like addiction has this sort of reciprocal thing where you become, you know, you have an addiction and then all of a sudden you become homeless. You know, I'm sure there's uh, other factors, but that can be a big one. And then at the same time, you know, you have the addiction and then, or, you know, you have the addiction, you become homeless, you become homeless and it can lead to an addiction because you're out, you're in the community, you're on the street, you're upset, you know, all, you're going through all this stuff. So it's not just so black and white. It, there's just so much stuff going on. What's the proportion ratio of men to women homelessness, if you know? I don't know if you guys have a number for that. I would say more men than women um, at least are counted because there's a lot more um, male shelters. I don't know the exact percentage, but I would say the women are more invisible in the homeless population because uh, you don't see them uh, as blatantly as the men. A lot of, uh, I spoke to someone who works uh, with some of the women, and she told me a lot of them were living in their car and stuff like that. So um, a lot of the women um, said it's just not that obvious. So they're sort of falling into the cracks there. Earlier you had mentioned about there are HIV shelters. What's the process of getting into a, like how do they know that they, do you guys go through testing before? Um, so I was talking about Peter's Retreat, which is a hands on Hartford program. Um, so that's a supportive housing um, program. So people, usually how it works with our program is that people are referred to us from the hospital or the clinic who we think would be a good fit for the program. Um, and have been, been diagnosed um, and then they can kind of work through. We have like a harm reduction program so they're definitely meeting the client where they're at and, and trying to work with them um, as, they're, as they're living with the virus. Okay, last question. Uh, hi, I have a question about uh, have you ever thought to unite some Mm, homeless people to run a business to make them better better life, they, so, such as cutting grass, something. Yeah, um, I don't know how many people are aware, but just last year there was a homeless bill of rights passed in this state. We're the only sec we're the second state in this country to have such a bill. Rhode Island was the first. Mm -hmm. And what it basically said is, you have to realize that homeless people, when they're stuck out of shelters they're pushed out, they go to public parks, public restrooms, they're being harassed, not being able to use them. What this bill says is they have a right to use it just like anybody else. They can't be harassed by police, but think about that. It brought together a group of people who actually were passionate about it, went to the legislature, talked to a state senator, and actually got a bill passed. So that was a group of homeless people coming together trying to make a positive change, but if you think about it, how sad it is that we had to pass the Homeless Bill of Rights because people are looked down upon. But there are groups and organizations, like our group is a bunch of people that are homeless, were homeless in transitional housing. So there are groups out there, there are voices. It is starting, like I said, it has to start and it has to snowball.